all right. So if I write this down now in the following manner, this is y1, y2, sorry, I should write this in this following manner, y1 Hermitian, y2 Hermitian till y n Hermitian times y1 y2 y n is equal to 1 1 1 1 until the first r entries the rest are all zeros what does that tell me about these y's can you tell me now y1 hermitian y1 is 1 y2 hermitian y2 is 1 until yr hermitian yr is also 1 what about the last n minus r fellows here their norms are 0 so the claim is y r plus 1 is equal to y r plus 2 is equal to dot 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 till y n is equal to 0 of size m agreed it must be so if you have to equal on if you have to have equality on both sides then it must be this agreed right no doubts about this also what can you say about y1 through yr mutually aren't they going to be orthogonal to each other because you see the cross coupling terms here are all zeros. So this is what? This is y1 Hermitian y2, y1 Hermitian y3, these are all zeros. So we will also say that y1, y2 till yr is a set of orthonormal vectors in CM. Yeah. Please ask if it's not clear. Is it true? Any doubts about why this is must this must be so? Yeah. You agree with this assessment so far? Okay. Did I hear a question somewhere? No? Okay. So now, what we have essentially shown is A, V, W inverse is equal to what exactly? y1, y2 till yr and then a whole bunch of zeros, is it not? Just that conclusion, just padding it here because r plus 1 onwards every other fellow is 0. Yeah, from whence I can write av is equal to, remember what w was? by my definition w was if i may use some abuse of notation with your permission i would just call it the square root of that sigma i mean i know it's something new sigma is a matrix a diagonal matrix but i'm just calling it square root of maybe sigma hat perhaps because i'm not picking out the non zero part i'm just picking out the i'm oh, sorry i'm not picking out the zero part i'm just picking out sigma 1 through sigma r okay maybe bad idea just let me write it let me not be lazy about this sigma r and then what is this identity 0 0 y1 y r and then another padding with zeros like this Huh? 
Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just a lapse of concentration there. Yeah. Y1, Y2, YR. And then sigma 1, sigma 2, till sigma r and i. Right? Yeah? So then, can I not write this as A is equal to this y1, y2, till y r added with all these zeros. I am constricting it because I have to make room. Excuse me for that. But this is sigma 1, sigma 2 till sigma r. Then the identity here, 0 here and 0 here. And V Hermitian. I am just hitting with V Hermitian on the right on both sides. Yeah? No issues so far? Is all right? Now I'm going to play a trick. Look, this is a set of R vectors, each of which is an M tuple. Yeah. If I expand this to something non-zero, and if I make this identity to be zero, okay, let me write that down, then you'll realize. So let's say y1, y2, till y r, let me call this part of the sub matrix as u hat, right? Then y tilde r plus 1 dot 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 till y tilde, uh, we need m because these are m tuples. I expanded in a very special manner. So that this is square and it's an orthogonal matrix, an orthonormal matrix in fact says that its transpose with itself leads to, the product of its transpose with itself leads to unit. I can do that by Gram-Schmidt. This is just a set of odd linearly independent vectors in CM. I can always expand it to an orthogonal basis. First I can expand it to any basis and then I can orthogonalize that basis by Gram-Schmidt procedure. So definitely this exists, but if I have to equal this, then I have to play a special trick. So I'll get rid of this identity here and I'll pause here for a moment for you to allow you to absorb this, okay? What's happening here? Earlier, this was sigma 1 times y1, the second column was sigma 2 times y2, so on till sigma r times yr. And the rest of it was anyway, although you had an identity here, they were not adding up to anything much. Now I put the onus of that 0 on this and added instead fellows here to make sure that this u hat augmented by u tilde gives me a full square matrix that is orthonormal, right? Or unitary in this case, right? Then this is true. Is this clear? If you have understood this, that is it. We have arrived at our desired. Where? No. This is called M tuples. Where? No, 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 no. This is M. This is M. This is N. So this is a rectangular matrix. This is a rectangular matrix now. I have gone on from this till here. It was probably square. But now I'm, I'm, I'm now making it rectangular. Yeah, good observation. So this now becomes rectangular. See, ultimately what I'm doing here is I'm taking a combination of R of these fellows, the rest of it doesn't matter. So now I'm placing, yeah, I'm playing around with the dimension. So now this has become rectangular. Until here it was square. But now this is rectangular. Yeah, nice. Thank you for that observation. So that is something that needs a mention. Indeed. The ultimate end of the day, my goal is to show that this is a rectangular matrix. So this must also be a rectangular matrix. All right. So this was m cross n, this was n cross n, and this was also n cross n. So the whole thing was m cross n. Now this is m cross m. 
So this has to be m cross n now. This fellow which was uh, square until this point, at this point has stopped being square. It is now m cross n, right? Thanks for that observation. That's the point I should have mentioned. Yeah, good that you're paying attention. Do you see what your friend has just pointed out? It's not just that the dimensions are intact. Now this is a square matrix. Until this point it wasn't a square matrix, no? If this fellow was square, so then this fellow could not have been square, right? Yeah? So this is true. And if this is true, we have one of the greatest results in matrix theory that will come across, which is the singular value decomposition. This is exactly what the singular value decomposition looks like. So this whole matrix now, we call it U. By my very nature of construction, this U is going to be unitary. V is already unitary. So for any matrix of size M cross N, I will always end up with a legitimate singular value decomposition where the fellows in the center here are the singular values, right? They happen to be the square roots of the eigenvalues of A Hermitian A. Just check that they will also be the square roots of the non-zero eigenvalues of A A Hermitian. As an exercise, try to check that the non-zero eigenvalues of A Hermitian A equal those of A A Hermitian. You don't have to go for um, determinants. You don't have to go for characteristic polynomials. You just apply the simple definition of eigenvalues. If you have A A Hermitian V is equal to some lambda V, hit it with the A Hermitian on, uh, on the left, and then you again have the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. Just check that, okay? I've dropped enough of a hint there. So this is something that exists for every matrix. The very important thing is also to, also to be noted here is that there is an ordering. Sigma 1 is greater than or equal to sigma 2 is greater than or equal to so on till sigma r is the so-called smallest singular value. Why is this interesting? There are fascinating aspects to this singular value decomposition, some of which will be very interesting revelations. And there's a reason why the moment people go for any proof using matrices, the first thing they assume is let this be the singular value decomposition of the matrix and then let's proceed with the proof. What is it? <clears throat> I'm saying that the image of the matrix A is equal to the span of, can you guess what? It's going to be y1, y2 till yr. So the singular value at once provides you with an orthonormal basis for the image of A, all right? And there's more to come. The kernel of A is equal to the span of, what is it? No, not that. It's a rectangular matrix, remember? The kernel must come from which space? It cannot come from CM. It has to come from CN, N tuples, no? The matrix A acts on N tuples, not M tuples. So kernel comes from the domain, not the co-domain. Yeah? So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to write V as V1, V2 till VR, and then VR plus 1 dot 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 till, what is the size n cross n, right? Vn. So this is going to be equal to the span of Vr plus 1, Vr plus 2, dot 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 till Vn. So the last n minus r fellows in the matrix V, the last n minus r columns of the matrix V provide you with an orthogonal basis for the kernel of A. The first r columns of the matrix U provide you with a basis, an orthogonal basis, an orthonormal basis for the image of A, all right? We'll look at a quick proof of this, but before we go for that proof, I'm going to just tell you something very interesting here. 
which is going to be the application. Maybe if after that we don't have time, we'll just do the proof of these two statements in the next lecture. But the very important application, which I'm not going to prove by the way, but hopefully you'll find it impressive and interesting. Yeah? That was, sorry? Ah, no, 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 this is V Hermitian. The way I've described it is V Hermitian. So the columns of V or the rows of V Hermitian, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So you had sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, those are the eigenvalues of A Hermitian A. So it's like diagonally element wise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, when you take a matrix and you want to take its square root, there are actually legitimate square roots of positive definite matrices. This is, no, no, no. I'm just talking about the sigma part, the non zero part. That is just an R cross R block. So, which is why I got rid of that square root notation because I felt it was a bad notation. I was being a little lazy and then I thought, no, let's just write it down legitimately. Just take the square roots of sigma 1 squared, which is sigma 1, the positive square roots. So, no, 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 no. When you take the entire matrix, that also does exist. If you have a. No, no, po square matrices, when you have positive definite square matrices, you can always write them down as uh, square roots. There are transformations that allow you to do that. Factorizations of matrices that allow you to write as, write them as product of, not exactly in, in the same manner, but you can factorize any matrix as, any positive definite matrix as. So not just the fact that A Hermitian A or A transposed A is positive definite, but every positive semi-definite matrix can also be written in the form of some matrix such that it is H transpose H. And such existences and things are routinely proved in a course on matrix theory, which is not what this course is. But still, maybe we will not have time for the proof of these results. We will we'll probably do that quickly in the next lecture and then move on with our original agenda, which is that of exploring the eigenvalue eigenvector question. We have been taking a slight detour because I feel this is an interesting application. But I will end with a fascinating application of this. So if you are transmitting data in the form of a matrix through a channel, okay, an array of numbers. So if you have a matrix A that belongs to say, I mean you can take it to be real numbers, complex numbers, whatever it is, how many numbers are there? You are transmitting MN variables and sometimes if M and M are very large, this is a whole, you know, different ball game, right? If it is some thousands and this is some millions then it million times thousand, a thousand million, yeah, huge numbers of chunks of data through matrices that you are transmitting. You might not want to do this, yeah. So you might want to transmit very efficiently. You cannot just say, oh, I am going to just transmit this sub matrix. That is not going to help. Think of an image. For example, you see that screen right behind you, yeah. And if I just transmit some of the pixel information from the bottom left corner, you would be left with nothing but this pink block here. That's not meaningful. You want to transmit this information, you want to compress this data and yet send in this information through a channel meaningfully so that someone receiving the data at another end can meaningfully reconstruct what you had actually transmitted. Remember MP3 files when they came in, maybe you were too, too young. We saw that happen when we were college students. So we saw the MP3 revolution, which also caused a lot of piracy by the way. but. Uh, you know, earlier in the CDs, you used to have some, uh, what, 20 odd songs in a CD and they used to be very costly and then suddenly this MP3 opened up and you had hundreds, maybe 500 songs in a CD in the MP3 format. That's all the magic of data compression, right? So this is an example of data compression. What if instead you are required to transmit information to the tune of some M plus N times some K, but K is much, much smaller than either of M or N, then it is a winner. If you are thinking of M is equal to 5, N is equal to 2, you may not see the advantage. But if you take M is equal to 5 million and this as 10 million, you will definitely see the advantage because this is of the order of 10 million times some maybe 20, so 200 million, whereas this is a huge number. Yeah. So definitely if you can do this, it is a winner. So what you need is essentially a close approximation of the actual MN, M cross N matrix, which matches it. Now, what do you mean by matching? Again, you need some idea about the distance. And we know one sure shot way of defining the distance is through norms. So there is this norm 
which if you recall while describing inner products we had described, actually it is an inner product, yeah. We had said it is A Hermitian B is the inner product. So this induces the norm, so the norm would be trace of A Hermitian A. So this is the norm squared, that is how it is defined. What do you think this is? Trace is the sum of the diagonal entries. I leave it to you to check, a moment's thought will lead you to the conclusion this is nothing but, it is like you are stacking up the entries of the matrix as a tall vector of size mn cross 1 and taking its two norm. This is just the sum of the squares of individual entries in case of a real matrix and sum of the squares of the moduli of those individual entries of the matrix if the matrix is a complex matrix. That is what this norm is. Now, if you want and this norm has got a name, it is called the Frobenius norm. It is a norm that is induced by that inner product. So this is the inner product, yeah, and this is the norm that that inner product induces. Now, the question that has been posed in this case is, can I find me a B, can I find myself a B? So minimize over all B such that rank of B is equal to K and what am I trying to minimize? The Frobenius norm of A minus B, I am sure you would agree that this is a meaningful thing to uh, minimize, right? Because you are trying to find the minimum rank K approximation, the best rank K approximation, sorry not minimum, I am fixing up a number K which is much much smaller than either of M or N. So A belongs to say C M cross N and I am trying to find a rank K approximation of this fellow which is this B. So this B is the minimizer, alright and it turns out that this B is given by and that is the best part of it, sigma 1 let us say y1 u1 Hermitian plus sigma 2 y2 u2 Hermitian plus dot 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 plus sigma k y k u k Hermitian. In other words, even before I go into an intuitive explanation of why this is good. I am not going to prove this. I am going to just intuitively explain why this is good. But just check the number of data points or number of actual numbers, actual complex numbers that you need to transmit. What are the sizes of these y's? Remember y's are columns of what? Sorry, uh, this is v, right? This is v. Sorry, this is v. So y's are columns of u. So these are m tuples. The v's are n tuples. How many of the y's are you picking out? K. So you have k times m that describes all the y's for you, all the requisite y's for you. And you have k times n which describes all the v's for you. And you have k singular values. So the total number of points or numbers that you are transmitting is m plus n plus 1. So compared to m plus n, 1 is a small number, it is almost of the order of m plus n times k as we had asked for. So if you are taking a very small rank approximation of a large matrix, then this is the best way you can do this. And why is this best? So let me give you a quick intuitive understanding of why this is best. Because now, you think about what your domain, the basis for the domain is. The basis for the domain is v1, v2, v3, dot, 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 so on. So along the v1 direction, what is your gain? What is your amplification? If you hit a vector of the form gamma v1 with this b, the gain is sigma1 times y1, but y1 has a norm unity. So the output's norm is amplified by sigma 1. So in fact, although I haven't proved it here, you can actually guess it from here, that y1 through yr over there 
they will span your image and the first few singular vectors are the best approximations. The importance of the singular values thereafter determine the importance of the corresponding singular vectors in u which are these. So this is the principal direction, the most important direction along which this linear map or this transformation assigns the maximum weight which is sigma 1, the maximum amplification. Along this direction it applies the second most important. So if you have to choose the most important direction then it is y1 and you give 0 to others. If you want to choose the two most important directions then you choose the first two. So that is how you come up with the conclusion that if you want to choose the k most important directions, the k principal directions, the best k directions because all other directions subsequent to those k from k plus 1 through r will have diminishing returns, will have diminishing weight. So I am not going to prove this again but it is a very very fascinating result and one that allows you significant advantage in terms of data compression like so, all right. So you need to only transmit this many number of complex numbers or real numbers as the case may be in order to allow your friend at the other end, at the receiver's end to be able to get a best reconstruction of the original A matrix that you had, okay. And now think about images and other sorts of data where you have to do this smartly in a spatial manner where because the matrix is like some spatial data arranged in some array, right. So you cannot afford to just give a very nice uh, faithful description of one part of the picture and the other part of the picture is completely blocked. Nobody cares about that image. Rather, you would have a low resolution image that has low resolution throughout, but at least the entire image is before you. So this is the smartest way to do this. This is the best way to do this. And the singular value decomposition allows you to do this. This is of course by no means the only or the most important application of singular value decompositions. If you are interested, do read up on them. There are several very fascinating examples and you will see much of the things that get talked about, for example, principal component analysis, so on and so forth. All of it is basically at the end of the day just singular value decomposition known by some other term or language, okay. So in the next lecture, first we shall prove this and then we shall get back on track with uh, any square matrix, not just symmetric matrices and all and we shall explore the eigenvalue, eigenvector question and more importantly the question of diagonalizability of a square matrix through a set of eigenvectors. Thank you.